what's up, my name's Techno, but here for Troubleshoot, and welcome back to another video. In this quick video, I'll be running through an awesome backup solution for Windows, Mac, Linux, Linux Server, etc. Recently, I've been working on my own Linux Server, hosting web APIs and other things like that, and I had to find a backup solution. Previously, I used Arclone to copy a bunch of files and then upload them to the cloud in an encrypted fashion, so I keep everything safe and in two locations, which is the best thing. Of course, it can also duplicate locally, but this program takes it a step further and actually can use it if that's what you prefer. It's free, open source, and it's available pretty much everywhere. The software that I'm talking about is Duplicity. Essentially, you can back up everything, it can keep them encrypted, it can put them on multiple places, run automatically, and it's completely under your control, not to mention it supports a ton of different standardized servers and protocols, FTP, SSH, Web, DAV, as well as Backblaze, Tardgrade, OneDrive, Amazon S3, Google Drive, Box Mega, and a ton of other things. It's awesome software, completely free, absolutely no subscriptions or anything like that. You have complete control over it. And if you're running a server with lots of Docker containers and things like that, you can get it there as well, set it up nice and easy. In this video, I'll be showing you how to set up for Windows. So in the description down below, you'll find the download link. Simply click your operating system here. For me, it's Windows and it'll download an installer. Of course, we have Debian Ubuntu, Mac OS X, etc. You can also find this in other locations. These are the main downloads for the software. For example, here on Docker, you can get the Duplicity container. And when you do eventually create yourself Duplicity, you'll essentially have a password to sign into it. Signing into my server's Duplicity here, you can see I'm backing up everything and backing up my Docker volumes which is all of my server stuff. Essentially, it's compressing three gigs into 1.55 gigabytes, so half the size. My Docker volumes are only 10% of the original size, and it keeps multiple versions, so you can go back and pull backups from previous days, previous hours, etc. These currently run FTP from my server to a backup server, but you can set it up in thousands of different ways. If I open up this one over here, for example, then restore files, you can see I have different volumes here that I can pick from different files, I can restore individual files, a bunch of files, and we can restore from different points over here. This uses incremental backups, so it's not backing up everything and one, it backs up one huge group and then little bits of data after that to save you a ton of space, not to mention it's encrypted and compressed. Regardless, let's get back to installing it. So I'll click the MSI here, run, next, Agree, next, with everything ticked, including launch duplicity at startup, so it can automatically back up in the background. I'll click next and install. Then I'll click finish and duplicity should start up. You should see your web browser opens and it takes you to localhost colon 8 8200. Then we have this over here. Is this a single PC or a server slash multi-user environment? Tick whatever you want here, whether it's just you or multiple people can use it. You can port forward this to access it through the internet, though for me, I won't be doing that here as it's my local PC. I'll click yes, just as I may want a password on this, I'll make it nice and simple. So a password, I'll click here and give it a password. I'll make mine nice and simple and I'll tick the password option over here. Then we can allow remote access, if you wish, prevent tray icon automatic login and a couple of other options over here, including language and display slash color theme, which I'll make the dark theme. Finally, we can choose a different update channel, which for me I'll leave as default, but you can choose beta, experimental, and canary. Leaving it as default, which is beta, is the best option here. The rest of these you can leave as is. We have advanced options here, though I won't be going through these. Essentially, you can get it to run a script before, after, send emails after backups are complete, etc., etc. There's tons of different options here. For now, I'll click OK, and OK once more because I've now set a password. I'll need to click here, enter my password, and when I do so, we'll be logged back into the dashboard. Awesome. So let's make a new backup. Add backup. I'll want to configure a new backup. Next, and let's give it a name. I'll say PC Backup. Description, you can fill in whatever you want here. If it's just you using this PC, you can leave this blank unless you want to write down something to remember this as. Encryption, you can choose AES or GNU Privacy Guard. Usually leaving this as AES is the simplest and the best option here. Then we can set a passphrase of the backup, which I would definitely recommend. It'll keep everything encrypted and secure just for you. You should absolutely have one of these if you're backing up to the cloud. So if someone logs into your account without your permission, they can't access any of your personal files and backups. For this, I'll set a nice strong password. Then I'll click next. 
we can choose a destination. From this, you can choose a local file or drive, any of these standard protocols for accessing storage over the internet, as well as some proprietary options over here, which is mostly cloud options. Box, Dropbox, Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, Rackspace, or Clone, which is a different one here. This is the different software that I was talking about. We can set up specific repositories, remote paths, etc. But that's only if you have our clone installed, for example. There's a ton of different things here and you'll definitely find what you're looking for. Just as an example, I'll keep this as a local folder or drive and I'll back up to a folder on my desktop. You should definitely pick a separate drive for backups. That way, if one fails, you have another copy on a different drive. For now, I'll call this backup and it's just empty. So I'll click here at the very top, copy the path here, manually type path and I'll paste it in. See users techno desktop backup. Awesome. Then we can enter a username and a password if required. But for me, because it's a local drive, I don't need to worry about this. Click test connection to make sure if the folder exists and you can access it. If it says connection worked, then we can back up here. That's especially important for FTP and other kinds of backup. Then advanced options. We can choose from a couple of things here and we can add as many as we'd want. We can set up requirements for SSL so it won't connect anywhere it shouldn't and things like that. For me, I don't have anything advanced, so I'll click next, and we can choose what we'd like to back up to this folder. So we have user data, which is commonly used folders like my documents, music, pictures, etc., etc. And if we choose to include something, we can expand it and choose to not include things inside of it. For example, I can tick my documents and untick things here so they aren't included in my backup. We can get as granular as you want here, though you can only tick something and cross things inside of it. You can't tick things inside of what you cross. So you'll need to have this enabled and uncheck everything in here that you want or don't want included. As soon as you add a cross, everything underneath it is not included. So it's really simple. For me, I'll give you an example with one of my busiest folders, my projects folder. Just for a sense of scale, my projects folder here will take a while to load and it's around 63 gigs, 86,000 files. Of course, you can get as big or as small as you want, for me, I think I'll have to put this on a different drive. I'll put it on H. There we go, backup. So I can head back here if you need. Destination, I'll paste it in and test connection, then next. So my projects are on a drive, then projects. We can also add a path directly and click add path. And right below it, we can expand filters. We can add filters here to include or exclude certain files based on what they have in their name, what they look like, etc. Usually you'd want to say exclude directories whose name contains, and you can say exclude maybe node underscore modules. If you're a program, it may be dot git folders, maybe something like cache, etc. It's all really up to what you choose. For me, I'll leave all of these as empty and I'll expand exclude, for example. We can exclude hidden files, system files, temporary files, and files larger than whatever we choose here. For me though, I'll leave all of these unticked as I want to back up absolutely everything inside of my projects folder. Next, and we can choose the time to get this to automatically run. You should absolutely have this ticked and all of the days ticked that you'd want to have it back up on. You can also choose to run it again every X days, minutes, hours, weeks, months, years, etc. For me, I'll run every day. Then I'll run it at maybe 1 a.m. Just make sure you leave your computer on and the next time it'll run is tomorrow, today's the 14th, at 1 a.m. Next. We can set how big each file on the backup will be. Leaving this at the default of 50 is good enough. Then the most important option, backup retention. We can choose to keep all backups or we can delete backups that are older than a certain number of days, weeks, months, years, keep a specific number of backups, or my favorite, the smart backup retention. Essentially, over time, backups will be deleted automatically. There will remain one backup for each of the last seven days, then each of the last four weeks, and each of the last 12 months. So seven days worth, then one for each week before that, and one for each month before that. This is the absolute best option. There will always be at least one remaining backup, which is great. Advanced options, we can choose things down here, such as buffering, core options. There's a ton of different options here, though the only ones you may be interested in is all the way down at the bottom to say, send mail. With all of these here, we can set up how email will be handed on this. We can get it to log into something when it's done and email us saying, hey, we've done a backup for you. This is the only real thing that I can think about. Maybe XMPP. 
don't, I won't really worry about that. Maybe even zip compression. We can set a specific compression level, compression method, etc, etc. But I'll just leave everything as default as it seems to work pretty well. Of course, disable encryption, which I won't use. So I'll leave it as is and click save. Now that we've set up a backup here, as soon as we come back to this page, we can expand PC backup or whatever it is, and we can choose from different options here, such as run now, restore files. I'll click run now, just so we have our first backup. Of course, backing up 60 something gigabytes will take quite a bit of time. You'll see the progress at the very top here in this bar. First, it counts files and file size, and you'll see it fills up from the start to the end as the backup goes. It goes relatively fast, and it'll go as fast as your CPU slash hard drive allows. Further, we can edit the configuration or export it if you'd like to take it to another computer. We can choose database. If anything happens to our backup, we can choose to recreate or repair it. Basically, this stores information about the remote backup on the local machine. This makes it faster to perform many operations and reduces the amount of data that needs to be downloaded for each operation. Usually, you won't need to worry about any of these options, really. Show log should show you errors and things like that under general. And under the remote tab, we'll see what's currently being messed around with, what's being added to, etc, etc. Cool. So you can see it's currently backing up 60 odd gigabytes at 60 megabytes a second, which is really good. And we can see what files are being backed up here. All we need to do is sit around and wait for this to finish. On top of this, while the backup's going, if at any stage you need to slow it down, you can click the little throttle icon over here and you can choose the max upload and download speed, which I'll leave unticked. You can run it in the background without worrying about throughput on any other program. And then we got the backups complete. As you can see, 63 gigs on source, 58 gigs on backup. It's not so bad. Of course, if this was uploading to the cloud or anything like that, when this eventually finishes, you'll be able to disconnect or shut down your PC, etc. And your backup will now be complete. Restoring files. Once again, we can expand specific backups here. Restore files. We can choose the files we'll want to restore, such as maybe this folder here. And we can choose to restore to the original location, a specified location, how we want to handle existing files, and of course, permissions for these, which is only really important if you're using something like Linux. Anyway, that's pretty simple. Let's say you install this on another computer. What exactly do we need to do to get things working and synced up with our existing backup? If you ever need to save, restore it when your PC completely dies, you reinstall Windows, how you get things back from your backup, as it won't be listed here. Well, of course, you'll need to remember that password and, of course, where you started. So for now, I'll simply close duplicity. You can see all of the backup files over here split up into 50 megabyte chunks. And of course, they've all got the AES extension, meaning that these are all encrypted. Opening up app data local, you can see everything here. There's a 200 megabyte file that tells me where my backups are and what exactly they are. This is the user files folder that you may lose when you reinstall your Windows or get to another PC. To simulate reinstalling Windows, I'll close duplicity through the task manager or of course through the start bar over here. Right click, quit. Then I'll simply rename this folder here or delete it entirely. For me, I'll just rename it. And let's fire up Duplicity again to see how it handles a new PC. Say you've just swapped over PCs, you've installed it. Of course, we'll need to set it up first. So this is maybe a single PC. I'm the only user. I won't set a password. How do we get things back? Well, we can choose Restore. Then we can choose to restore directly from a backup. Next. Now we need to choose the backup location. This should match exactly whatever it was, FTP, OneDrive, Google Drive, or local storage. For me, I put this on H and backup. Then once again, username or password if you added one and advanced options down here. I'll test connection so it actually works. And next, now we need to enter a passphrase, which for me, I'll enter now. Advanced options, we can choose certain things here. For me, I'll leave this empty, connect, and assuming your password is correct, it'll try and retrieve the database or recreate a database, adding it to our PC. So this, of course, will take some time depending on the size of your backup, the speed of the drive or cloud service you're connecting to. And eventually when it's done, we can choose specific backup times, choose specific files to backup from, etc. For me, I can choose something and restore it anywhere on my PC. Checking the home over here, you can see there's nothing here. Even after a refresh, it's empty. We can choose add a backup, configure a new backup, give it a name. So maybe my PC and we can choose encryption. I'll enter the exact same password here twice. This is the original password I used with this folder. Next, I'll choose the exact same location once more. 
and we can choose what we'll want to back up from my current PC. For me, I chose my projects folder, so I'll choose it once more. I'll set a backup time so we can continue backing up whenever we re-add it. Next, I'll choose Smart Backup, save, and you'll see backup has never run. But if we choose Restore Files over here, you can see we're hitting an error. Fail to fetch path information, listing prefixes is not supported without a local database. Consider using the repair option to rebuild the database. This is what we need to do. So I'll head back to the home directory, expand my PC, and then database under advanced over here. Then I'll choose repair, and we'll need to wait for this to repair. Closing my password saving notification at the top, you'll see recreating database. All we need to do is wait for this to finish, and we have an error at the bottom here. I'll just dismiss this. Once again, it'll depend on the speed of your PC and whatever you're connected to, whether it's a drive or your internet. There we have it. It's now done. We can head into restore files, and you should now see your different backup dates up here, your different files, etc. We're back to where we should be. We've now reconnected on a brand new PC, a different PC, a different install of Windows, etc. This works between different OSs, Windows, Mac, Linux, different networks, etc, etc. It's an awesome tool, and just for fun, I'll click Compact Now. I don't think anything fancy will happen. Nope, it didn't really do anything. File size hasn't changed. Not entirely too sure what this would be, but I'm pretty sure it's for the incremental backups when they run. Anyways, that's really about it. I'll set this up to backup to the cloud. If you like a specific guide showing how to link it to the cloud, maybe I'll create another one and you'll find it linked in the description down below. For now, keeping it backed up to a second drive is definitely something I'll have. Just quickly adding to my video, if you choose to use a different compression method, such as LZMA, these are the different options we have here. Deflate is the default. It should give you better compression. However, it'll only listen to the zip compression level. If you're not setting a custom zip compression method, you can ignore this option here and rather set compression level. So I'll delete this as I'll be using LZMA, which should give the best compression, maybe the highest CPU usage while it's backing up, but it should compress things nice and small. This is just one of the many options we have here. And that's it for this video. Thank you all for watching. My name's been taking over here for Troubleshoot, and I'll see you all next time. Ciao!